I'm Steve Huffner, and on behalf of the Election Law at Ohio State program, I welcome you to our roundtable on the problem with plurality winner elections and can requiring majority winners help save democracy. This is a discussion of what we believe is an underappreciated problem of our country's electoral processes. And in a moment, I will offer a brief overview of this problem. But first, let me also now welcome and introduce the four panelists who will take part in our discussion. After my overview, we will first hear from my OSU colleague, Ned Foley, who holds the Eversold Chair in Constitutional Law here at Ohio State and is the director of the Election Law at Ohio State program. He has published numerous articles and several books concerning election law, including his most recent book, Presidential Elections and Majority Rule. We are also delighted to have with us three guests who will react to Ned and offer their own views on our topic today. Franita Tolson is professor of law at the University of Southern California Gould School of Law, where she is also the vice dean for faculty and academic affairs. She too has published widely in the field of election law and voting rights, including a new book, In Congress We Trust, question mark, which explores Congress's role in protecting voting rights. Beginning in early 2020, Franita and Ned have been co-hosts of the podcast series, Free and Fair with Franita and Foley. So it's great to have Franita with us again today. Also with us is Derek Muller, who is professor of law at the University of Iowa, where he is the Buma Fellow in Law. He too has published widely in the field of election law with a particular academic expertise concerning the role of states in administering federal elections which as I will note in a moment, is a critically important piece of the context for our discussion today. Welcome to Derek as well. And then rounding out our round table is Rachel Kleinfeld, who holds a doctorate in philosophy from Oxford University in the field of international relations and is a senior fellow in the Democracy, Conflict and Governance Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She is a leading expert on how democracies can improve with a particular focus on democratic stability and dealing with the problems of polarization, violence, and corruption. And so we're delighted to have Rachel with us as well today. So welcome to each of you. So now uh, let me briefly set the stage by offering an overview of the problem of plurality elections. And then I'll invite Ned to spend a few minutes fleshing out this problem with a not so hypothetical example and some alternative electoral structures. And then we'll let Derek and Fernita and Rachel each weigh in and have our roundtable discussion. So why are we here today? As a country, we tend to pride ourselves on the notion that we are governed by the principle of majority rule. And we venerate our elections as the processes by which we operationalize this principle. In point of fact, however, most states have structured their electoral processes so that the victorious candidate is not required to receive a majority of the votes cast. Instead, in most states, it is sufficient merely to have received more votes than any other candidate. This is the definition of a plurality winner election. The winner is the candidate with the most votes, even if that is less than 50%. Now, of course, if only two candidates are running, the candidate with the most votes will indeed have a majority of the votes. But as this map shows, most states general elections permit more than two candidates to compete for a given office and then award the electoral prize to whichever candidate has the most votes, even if that is less than a majority. Alternatives to plurality winner elections, as you can see on this map, include runoff elections uh, and various forms of instant runoff elections using ranked choice ballots. Now, as Derek's work has explored extensively, states make many of their own decisions, not only about how to conduct their state and local elections, but also about how to conduct their elections for their members of Congress. And as this map shows, a few states today do depart from the plurality winner rule. But there is no obvious reason other than historical inadvertence that most states today rely on the plurality winner rule. And moreover, and this is the key point for today, there is reason to fear that the existence of the plurality winner systems 
as an entrenched feature of our electoral structures, yet one that is by no means necessary or foreordained, may box out other candidates in a way that can mask the existence of and the identification of a preferred candidate who is more strongly favored by a majority of the electorate. And if this is true, it may also be that the plurality winner rule is itself a significant contributor to today's partisan polarization, precisely because the winners of these elections are not necessarily the strongest majority preferred representatives. Although it is common to try to place much of the blame for today's polarization on partisan primaries, the partisan primaries may in fact only be able to have the impact they do have because they are the feeders for plurality winner general elections, which then box out the stronger candidate. That is to say stronger when measured by the actual degree and depth of voter support. And all of this may then be a significant factor in our present political dysfunction and our elected representatives inability to find common ground. Indeed, as we think about the announced Senate retirements of at least five moderate Republicans, we ought to ask not whether the underlying problems that may have contributed to these re retirements have mainly to do with their threat of being primaried from the right, but whether at bottom, it is mainly the lack of a general election structure designed to identify the true majority winner, the one candidate who would defeat each of the other candidates in a head-to-head -head matchup that is causing these senators to head for the exits. So that is the question that we want to explore today. Do plurality winner elections obscure true majority preferences? And if so, what might we do? So for some additional exposition of this issue, let me now turn to Ned. Ned? Thanks so much, Steve. Um, and let's illustrate what you've been talking about by focusing specifically on Ohio's upcoming US Senate election next November, a year from now. Um, and the incumbent uh, Senator in Ohio, Rob Portman is one of those uh, who's heading for the exits, as you said. Uh, and that means looking ahead, we can envision a November general election between the Democratic Party nominee who's likely to be a member of Congress named Tim Ryan and his uh, Republican opponent, that's whoever wins the contested Republican primary to replace Portman. And if uh, our audience has been following the national news about this Ohio Republican primary, you would all know that uh, there are several contestants who are really tripping over each other right now to show who's most loyal to former President Donald Trump. Um, the leader in at the moment, based on the public opinion polling that exists, um, happens to be a local politician named Josh Mandel. And he's showing his allegiance uh, to Donald Trump by really fully embracing the so-called big lie that the 2020 election was stolen against Trump. And, and Mandel is really making his mark by being part of that conspiracy theory. Uh, so as a result of, of where the dynamic is right now, we can imagine uh, this possibility um, next November. So, um, you know, on the result of the election might be having these as the two main candidates with the result something like a 55-45 split. Re remember, uh, Ohio is a state now that President Trump won pretty handedly. And so Mandel could win by a similar margin. Um, now, you might look at that 55-45 split and think, wow, that's democracy, small d democracy at work. Mandel is the majority winner decisively. But this is where, as Steve said, it's the rule, the plurality winner rule that is masking, uh, in effect, a missing candidate. Um, so we could, again, imagine the possibility that incumbent Rob Portman is kind of looking ahead and having second thoughts, perhaps, you know, why am I not in this race? I think I have something to offer as an alternative. I may not uh, 
may not make sense for me to try to get the nomination of my own party, which has gone full Trump. I don't see myself as a proponent of the big lie, uh, but I don't see myself as a big spending Democrat either. And I think there ought to be a role for me in the middle. And you know, so we have to think about the possibility that he could try to run as an independent. But this is where the effect of the plurality winner rule really makes its mark because we can imagine Portman, if he did run as an independent, pulling votes away from um, Ryan and Mandel. And again, we can only guess without you know, better public opinion, opinion polling on this point, you know, to what degree he would pull away from the other two candidates. But the key idea here is that it doesn't make any sense for him to even enter the race as an independent and try unless he could become the plurality winner because the plurality winner rule is whoever has the most votes, as Steve said. So, you know, with this hypothetical, um, you'd still have Mandel as the plurality winner and Portman really in third place. Again, Portman might do better than that. He might get up to 30% or whatever, but it just doesn't make sense for him to even try to be a third candidate uh, in a plurality winner system unless he can beat the other two. And as popular as he may be with his voters, uh, it's it's just, uh, you know, the, the Republican nominee and the Democratic nominee have an intrinsic advantage. One of the reasons why we've illustrated this hypothetical with Portman's numbers at only 15% is to show that even being in last place and far behind in a plurality system, he still may be the true majority preferred candidate in this three-way race. Now, how could that be given only 15%? That's where um, the head-to-head -head analysis that Steve mentioned is really important. And for that, we need to look at ranked ballots, um, the kind of ranked choice ballots that Alaska and Maine Look, so let's suppose that Ohio actually used ranked choice ballots. What might that be? Well, let's look at those Mandel voters. They're likely to rank Ryan last as the Democrat and rank Portman second. At the opposite end of the spectrum, the Ryan voters are likely to put Mandel last and Portman in second. You know, the Portman voters are a little more complicated. Some of them will pick Mandel second because they're more loyal to party uh, and wouldn't want a Democrat at all. But there'll be a sliver of voters who do not embrace the big lie and are willing to cross party lines to put uh, Ryan second and Mandel third. Um, and once you have these ranked ballots, you can then do the head to head analysis that um, Steve mentioned. So. How does that work? So let's first look at Portman versus Mandel. And to do that, we ignore Ryan, since we're just comparing these two. And we see that Portman uh, ranks ahead of Mandel on these three clusters of ballots. Doesn't matter whether Portman's in first place or second place, he's ahead of Mandel on all these ballots. Mandel's ahead of Portman only in those. So Portman beats Mandel 55, 45. And just let's think about what this means. This means the entire Ohio electorate is asked essentially the question, which do you prefer, Portman or Mandel? And the answer is Portman, 55, 45. Portman is the majority for preferred candidate in that one-on-one -on -one comparison. So we can do the same thing, Portman versus Ryan. We ignore Mandel at this point. And we see that Portman is ahead of Ryan on these ballots. Again, either first choice or second choice doesn't matter, still ahead of Ryan. Ryan's only ahead of Portman on those ballots. So when Ohio voters are asked, which do you prefer, Portman or Ryan, a strong majority, 60-40, say they prefer Portman to Ryan. As we saw before, if, it, if the two-person race is Mandel versus Ryan, Mandel be, wins that 55-45. But the, the key idea here is that um, Portman is the candidate that beats the other two 
in these head-to-head -head one -on one-on-one matches. That shows that Portman is the strongest candidate in terms of being most preferred by a majority of, of Ohio's voters. So can there be an electoral system that allows this true majority preference to be revealed? And the answer to that is yes. Um, it's a version of ranked choice voting. It's a, a slight modification of the system that's already in place in, in Maine and, and Alaska. So you take these exact same ranked ballots with these same preferences, and it, you run it through a system called bottom two runoff, which again is just a, a modification of the instant runoff voting system that Alaska and Maine use. Now, what Maine and Alaska would do would be to look at Portman being in last place among the first choice preferences, knock Portman out and redistribute the ballots that had ranked Portman first to Ryan and Mandel. And that would result in the 55-45 victory for Mandel that we saw before. But what the BTR bottom two runoff system does is it looks at the head-to-head -head comparison of the two candidates with the lowest first choice preferences. So that's Portman and Ryan. And we've already seen that head-to-head. -head. Uh, we see that again that Portman beats Ryan head-to-head. -head. That's the runoff that this system uses. And so it knocks Ryan out as the defeated candidate of that runoff, that head-to-head. -head. So Portman wins that and, and the ballots that ranked Ryan first get redistributed to Portman. That makes Portman defeating Mandel reaching the majority threshold to be the winner. So here's an electoral system that does allow the true majority preference of the entire electorate to show through. It, it reaches a result that's opposite of the plurality winner system that Mandel would have prevailed in. But perhaps most importantly, as Steve alluded to, it allows a candidate to show that they are the majority preferred candidate. In our hypothetical, it's Portman. In other races, it might be somebody different. But here's the illustration of how Portman, who is basically boxed out of the plurality system, could run and show a majority preference in this alternative system. So with that, Steve, let me turn it back to you for discussion. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Ned, for uh, giving us that way of concretizing the ideas with that hypothetical. So let me now bring in Derek and Fernita and Rachel to offer some of their initial thoughts on our topic, and then we will uh, get to our roundtable discussion. And we'll also invite audience participants to submit questions or comments using the Q&A function in the Zoom webinar, and we will do our best to get to as many of those questions as, as we can. So Derek, let me start with you. What are your thoughts about um, the way we've structured this roundtable discussion on the topic of the problem with plurality winner elections and perhaps specifically about Ned's hypothetical presentation. Yeah, great. Um, you know, it's an area I, I think a lot about and I never have, I never have great answers. So I feel like I'm always going around and around in my own voting cycle, uh, thinking about the best way of holding these elections. So I appreciate Ned's presentation and giving us, uh, you know, a concrete one to, to think about. Um, first, you know, I, I jump to an easy point, or at least easy to me, uh, in terms of whether or not you can do this. And I think it's totally within the state's power, totally within Congress's power to determine the manner of holding elections. And to the extent that, that we think this is, I think everyone would agree, it's an election. It's a, it's a way of voting and expressing preferences. Um, it's something that Congress could do pretty readily and apply to every federal election in the United States. Or it's something that states, and maybe this is where it ought to begin at least, um, states should experiment and try these things out. You know, I think that some of the other systems we've talked about, you know, I think California and Washington adopting top two, for instance, um, you know, has, has led to some unusual situations, some, some uh, I, I, where there's two Republicans or two Democrats running in the general election for a Senate or a representative office. Um, and that's, that's, that's sort of a strange result in one sense when people are going to the general election and finding only one candidate on the ballot. And, and that's just picking one example of one 
way where we might wonder about some of these mechanisms and how they play out, you know, on the one hand in theory and then in the real world as, as they're, they're, they're out there. So I would love to see some states experimenting and trying a, a procedure like this. Um, you know, but there are there are a couple you know reactions to it. One is I think Ned Ned is right in identifying this as a way of um, helping solve that problem of of a, of what the public really wants, what a majority really wants. And that's what the goal of this system is, right? To try to to discern the majority preference and not simply convert whatever mechanism we have to getting to a result that spits out fifty percent plus one that gets us that majority winner. Um, at the same time, I think about a couple of, of, of things. One is, you know, we've kind of accepted plurality elections in a lot of places. And it's a reason why the two parties are so effective in sort of gobbling up the majority, the vast majority of the party's preferences, uh, of the electorate's preferences. Um, we, we typically get two majority winners uh, or near majority winners or de facto majority winners simply by the nature of the two party system in the United States. And so it's interesting, I think. As Ned sets it up, this is a problem maybe arising of the Republican Party um, embracing a faction of what Republicans believe, or particularly what Trump supporters believe, suggesting maybe there should be an independent candidate. It also reflects an interesting sort of countervailing point about the Democratic Party, about choosing a nominee who could gobble up those sort of centrist preferences and finding candidates who could sort of reflect the will of the majority of the state by, by pulling in those other independent voters. And we can look around the United States and see, you know, Susan Collins in Maine to, to Joe Manchin in West Virginia to see, you know, vanishingly few, but places where candidates are able to maybe garner majorities in ways that they weren't able to, to, to gather in other, uh, other places around the country. So I also think about it as a, you know, what is one party doing, but how is the other party responding to it? Why is it creating that, that opportunity in the middle? That's one. Um, the second, and I think maybe, maybe it's a, Maybe it's something the public can get over, if I can use that term. <laughs> but to open with sort of the thought that this is the true majority winner by saying, well, the candidate who opened with 15% of the vote is really the winner of this election. And the candidate who got 40% of the vote is the one we're first knocking out. Um, again, intellectually, I get it. <laughs> I think the people on this call can understand how it plays out. And for the electorate, I think when they have confronted plurality elections or runoff elections in Louisiana and Georgia or top two elections in California or uh, you know, instant runoff in Maine or whatever it might be, um, they, they understand, they adapt to the rules of the system and they get it. But I, I think there is a huge, huge um, messaging barrier to think about the notion that the 15% candidate is the true winner, if you think about it. Um, so I, I, I puzzle about that component too. Again, logically it makes sense to me, but thinking about how it plays out in real time and how the public would react to it uh, is another. And I think there was some, some consternation in New York City this election about uh, a candidate who appeared to have the, the, the plurality of the first round votes and wondering if he would later be overtaken in subsequent round of votes. We expect that's what instant runoff voting is supposed to do, right? But but we also have this election night first ballot results <laughs> that I think are a huge anchoring mechanism for the public. Um, and again, it gets nothing to the legality of the question, but I'm thinking more about the practicalities and fine tuning it. Um, and with that, I look forward to hearing the co-panelists' uh, remarks. Great, thanks, Derek. And there are a lot of things there that I hope we'll be able to, to get back to and, and dig in. Uh, I'll just mention really quickly that I do think you're right that um, it's a real paradigm shift to be inviting the public generally to think in these terms. And I think it would require, um, in some sense, showing the public that this is about head to head races. And that's why somebody who in the system we're used to gets 15% is in fact the majority favorite. But if you show them all the head to heads, that's that's the way you would have to sort of bring people along and it's a dramatic paradigm shift. Um, and as to your point about, in fact, the two parties using the system we now have to great effect and often coming up with majority winners, that's also true. But that's not to deny the potential that that system is excluding and boxing out candidates who would run and might be the majority preference candidate if we didn't have that system. But we can dive into that more as we go. So let me ask Fernita now um, for her thoughts. Fernita. 
Hey, thank you so much for um, inviting me to this conversation. I think it's an important one, um, particularly after January 6th, where we're still sort of dealing with the fallout of all of that. And, um, and in some ways, it's forced us to be reactive um, because, um, as Ned mentioned in his presentation, uh, some of the people running for the seat have, you know, went all in on President Trump. And so part of that is adopting a certain worldview that's inconsistent with a system of free and fair elections. Um, so I think January 6th and sort of the fallout of that forces us to be wary of rules that um, undermine faith in the system. Um, and this is true, even though 2020, by all um, objective metrics, was a, 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 an election in which it was a free and fair election. Um, but I think it's undeniable that the current system uh, is contrary to the majoritarianism that is generally the focus of our system. Um, so we're used to uh, elections in which um, there are pl plurality winners, but you know our system is one where we really do like majoritarian preferences to hold sway. Um, Ned has written about this extensively in um, his book about presidential elections and how post 12th Amendment, um, the, the system was sort of expected to work where the president will be um, a product of majority choices. Um, but that being said, I do think that our system is one that can still facilitate conspiracy theories and conjecture in part because it's such an imperfect way of selecting candidates, either presidential or congressional. Um, so the election, the electoral college, for example, allows a popular vote loser to become president, right? And so um, we could easily imagine what would have happened if President Trump would have won in that context, right? January 6th was bad, and that, that was a situation in which he actually lost um, <laughs> both the, the popular vote and the Electoral College. Um, but as Ned points out, in the context of congressional elections, uh, the fact that states can adopt rules that are sometimes counter to majoritarianism can also help sort of fuel this sense that the system isn't working or that the system is not accurately um, uh, communicating majority preferences. Uh, so undoubtedly, I am on board with the idea of some type of change that endorses a majority winner. Um, that being said, I, I, I worry about this, this bottom two runoff. Um, I think that it's a very sort of creative solution. Um, and, I, and I think I agree with the general premise behind it. Uh, but if, if I'm starting from the position that we have to be wary of rules that could cause the electorate to lose faith, um, taking someone who is in third and, and, and sort of putting them out as first strikes me as a rule that could um, cause voters to question <laughs> whether or not the election has be, been free and fair. So I take Steve's point about sort of showing that this is about the head-to-head -head matchups, but I don't think that the electorate is sophisticated enough or, or honestly like patient enough to fully embrace um, having to sort of think through how the person who came in first um, got there. Um, people are just, you know, they're very simple. They're like, we voted, this is who won, and, and this is who we have to go with. And so I worry, and, and so maybe it's similar to Derek's point about this being about messaging. I'm not sure there's a way to convey the message that this is a, a system in which, hey, actually this person is the majority, uh, the preferences of the majority. Um, so, so I don't know if that's the, the right rule. Um, and I do think when we talk th through these uh, questions of how you determine a majority winner, the rule, the rule matters, even in that context. So for example, um, with Georgia's runoffs, uh, when they have the, the later election, voter turnout is, is incredibly low, right? What we saw in January 2020 was an exception because we're very polarized and those seats determined control of the Senate. Uh, but in general, runoff elections have, you know, very, very low voter turnout. And it tends to, it, it seems weird to me that even if that's a majority winner, that that ad accurately reflects the preferences of the majority when most people aren't turning out to participate. Um, whereas if you have instant runoff voting, um, then that makes more sense to say that the preferences of the majority uh, are holding sway. Um, so, so I think at a basic level, we're agreeing, uh, but I'm not sure if this, was, if this is the type of rule that I think would uh, adequately capture um, the concern that post-January 6th, we have to think about what, how these rules contribute to the conspiracy theories and conjecture that led to January 6th in the first place. Great. Thanks, Renita. Well, you may be right that um, for those of us who are immersed in these issues and come at them from a somewhat academic perspective, we can see the the value of something like the bottom two runoff, but that we need to think alternatively about other ways of introducing head-to-head -head elections as a concept uh, where we just don't produce a 
tally of the kind we're used to. Instead, we've produced a tally that is who's the candidate who's won the most of the head-to-head -head matchups among all candidates, right? So there are alternatives that, that we might have time to explore today. Thank you, Pranita. So Rachel, I'll now invite you to share some of your reactions. Go ahead. Sure, thank you very much. So I'm not an election lawyer and I'm not going to, to jump into um, the rules of the game. I study international relations and comparative politics. And from that standpoint, I just wanna point out why this matters, that America's in a really acute place right now. And it can be really hard to see that when I studied um, international violence in my last book, I, I did a lot of work in Italy uh, on the mob. And I call it the Italy problem, that when you're eating really good pasta and you're looking out over beautiful scenery, it can be really hard to realize that your country's rotting from within. Um, and, and I think America's in this kind of place where things are basically seem to be okay in a lot of people's lives. And so seeing the level of problem is really hard. But prior to 2016, if you looked at the number of Americans who thought that the system was rigged, you had strong majorities from both parties. You had numbers over 76% on multiple polls saying that they thought the system was rigged, that the um, uh, political as well as the economic system, we had a great deal of, um, of anger toward this, the system. You had people pulling away from both political parties and elites really not paying attention to that. I sit on the board of Freedom House and globally, We've, we're in our 15th year now of democratic recession around the world, and America's faced some of the greatest democratic backsliding in the Freedom House rankings. We're a very old democracy, and so we tend to take it for granted, sort of the way kids take their parents for granted. It'll always be there. You can always count on our democracy. But I think we forget that we're also a very new democracy in a certain way. We've only attempted to be an inclusive multiracial democracy since 1965. Prior to that, we had more than 10 states that after a brief period of enfranchisement held on to one party rule through um, changes to legal rules and through violence. And so that one party rule in, in more than 10 states uh, disenfranchised large parts of our country. And that's how we managed to have our democracy until 1965. And it wasn't just African-Americans, Native Americans were disenfranchised until 1962 in Utah, 1948 here in New Mexico. Um, so, it's a, it's a new democracy in that way, and it's on par with a lot of the decolonized democracies. And we really shouldn't take for granted that it can face the same kind of backsliding that we're seeing in Hungary and India and Indonesia. In these countries, what we see overseas is that countries are not losing their democracies by coup. What they're losing is elected leaders who get in and change rules and um, dem democratic publics that care about their partisanship just slightly more than they care about their institutions. So on po polls, they say they care about democracy, but they care about their party slightly more. And so on margin calls, um, they, they tend to, to pick party and, um, and the democracy slowly slips away. Now, our institutions exacerbate this. America is really unique. We do democracy assistance all over the world and all over the world, we do not create systems like ours. And that's because presidential majoritarian systems like ours are particularly at risk. Fewer than five have maintained continuous democracies over the last 50 years. And those five include Costa Rica, I mean, really small countries. Um, our institutional structures exacerbate all of the fault lines in our demographic, demographics and politics. Um, we know internationally that winner take all systems are more violent. There's a temptation to use violence to swing a few voters when you have a winner take all system. We know that two party systems tend to be the most polarized. They have these us them dynamics. There's fewer chances for deal making um, and so on. We know that fewer parties are less representative and tend to uh, push people toward extremism that leads to greater violence. That either even when you get parties that are extreme in politics like the AFD in Germany or um, the Golden Dawn in Greece, really ugly violent parties sometimes as in Greece, they actually moderate um, because you can see how ugly and violent they are when they're in politics. So multi-party systems tend toward much more moderation. And so you see in countries like Denmark, far higher levels of affective polarization of just hatred of the other party, but far less danger to their democratic systems because their institutions don't exacerbate the problems they have, whereas ours at every choice point exacerbate the problems. Um, and it's why countries like Northern Ireland after war pick ranked choice multi-member PR systems. 
And so I think that, that looking at that is important. These systemic changes seem really bland and they won't solve all of our ills because they have to interact with uh, demographics, they have to interact with uh, the, the um, culture. It's why Louisiana, for instance, on your map, uh, you know, has a majoritarian system, but Louisiana, which has no primaries, has a very old system of one party rule. It has very high levels of violence. It has very old political corruption. Getting rid of primaries and majority winners in that system doesn't help so much. You know, there's a lot of things going on in Louisiana. But in other states, I think this kind of system could help. Um, I do agree with Frenita that we are now in a very low trust moment. America used to be a very high trust country. High trust countries gain a lot. Um, you lower transaction costs in high trust countries, you increase GDP. And one thing that high trust countries can do is um, have a lot of norms that um, don't require as many rules. Uh, you, you just uh, can, can do a lot more in high trust countries. We are no longer a high trust country. We are a quite low trust country. And in a low trust country, you need to be really careful of how rules change trust. Um, and so I think making something like this very clear and transparent is important. And I agree that sort of having the low level winner come out on top looks bad. But I also think that um, we know in polling, and I know from Santa Fe, I live in Santa Fe, which is a, a city that has ranked choice voting. Actually, we passed it 10 years ago and the, um, the political parties held it back for 10 years, wouldn't let it pass. And the, a judge finally said, you have to do this. Two months, I think, before our, our election, it might have been less than that, it might have been six weeks. And so they had a very short time to introduce it to the public. And what that experience taught me personally and what the polling shows is that elites think ranked choice voting will confuse regular voters. And regular voters say, no, actually, this is not that hard to understand. Um, we understand how to rank things one, two, three. Um, we kind of get how it works. And I think this round robin kind of situation is the same thing. If you run through all the math, frankly, even I get confused. I'm not a math person. But if you show it in a head to head, I don't think it's actually that confusing. And I don't think it looks that non-transparent. And I think it's worth just remembering and I'll end here that our system's just not that old. Primaries were a progressive innovation. We used to have RCV in some places. We used to have open voice votes for that matter. I mean, the closed polling and voting system is also an innovation. So we're constantly updating our system. There's a reason to change it now for, um, reasons of the levels of, of polarization and violence our country's facing, but doing it in a transparent manner, I think is pretty important given the low trust. Rachel, thank you for those perspectives. Those are incredibly valuable. Um, and you know, your point about how there are a lot of interactive effects here in terms of other dimensions of our system is a critical one, but so also is the notion that there might be uh, some real value at this moment in uh, promoting some experimentation along these lines. We've got um, a, a bunch of questions that are great, but I also want to bring Ned back into the conversation. And Ned, maybe what I'm going to do is just really quickly tie together two of those audience questions as a way to invite your response to the things that Derek and Fernita and Rachel have said. One question from the audience was observing that our current system often even when it produces a so-called majority winner is based on a relatively low turnout. So in some sense, it's still not necessarily a majority of the represented constituents. And how does that affect what we think about any of this? And my own initial reaction to that is to, is to come back to something Derek said, which is how the political parties have sort of co-opted the existing plurality system in a way that breeds less participation precisely because there are large swaths of the electorate who don't really like the two candidates they're given as their choice. And the resulting winners, even if they are a majority of those who vote, aren't very representative because the voters haven't been given a good choice. Um, and, and then the other question that I think, Ned, you might be interested in including in the initial response is about alternative ways of structuring something like this, including what's the difference between what you've been talking about and approval voting. So let me just sort of now invite your response, Ned, and then we'll get going. Sure, thanks. And they, yes, all these comments are incredibly helpful. Um, so picking up, I think on one thing that Rachel said, um, I wanna make a plug for a, a book 
by another political scientist uh, whose his name is Lee Druckmann, and he's written a book that has the phrase "doom loop" in the title about, and it and it's a puts forward for the United States a version of the multi-member districts with ranked choice voting that Rachel mentioned that would be suitable for the U.S. House of Representatives as a whole new way to kind of bring a proportional representation system into into at least part of the American electoral system. Um, you know, whatever you think about that idea, and it's a creative idea and it's worth pursuing, you know, the nature of US Senate elections and gubernatorial elections mean that that kind of PR system just doesn't work because there's just gonna be a single winner of a US Senate race and, and, and a gubernatorial race. So we so the, the effort uh, to do the kind of electoral reform that America needs might be a multifaceted effort. We have to deal with the problem of gerrymandering, for example, that we're not talking about, about today. And I think all of the problems is in part what causes low turnout and disaffection. You know, you know the lack of competition and the, and the alienation has multiple factors in it, as well as the one that, that we're talking about today. Um, uh, and I also, to pick up on Fernita's point, I think it's absolutely critical into thinking about majority winners that you think about turnout and you think about, you know, are we talking about the November election? Or are we talking about a runoff after November where you lose turnout? Or are you talking about a primary before November where you lose turnout? I mean, all of these component variables need to be need to be considered as, as we, we measure this, which is why to pick up on Derek's point, I think we do need experimentation. Um, I've got a paper in draft that I, I think um, the other panelists know about, which is to say that what Congress should do is not micromanage a single answer and, and force one size fits all on every single state. But if, if, we've, if, if there's a consensus that the current plurality winner system is not good, but we're not sure what the best majority winner system is, Congress could simply say, choose among different majority winner systems um, but just don't use the plurality winner. And that would kind of cause the experimentation uh, that Derek's talking about. And, and we would have real world examples. So we would see if you know one system has some uh, unintended consequences that don't seem very palatable and other systems uh, do, do better. And, and finally, because I want to hear from the other panelists again, I think, um, to the extent that other people have talked about the, the the peculiarity of this bottom two runoff and how that's a real head scratcher <laughs> when somebody you know with 15 percent could end up winning i want to embrace steve what you said which is um you know it's it would be a a bigger uh transformation but um to pick on that round robin terminology that I think Rachel mentioned, maybe somebody else did as well. Um, you know, those of us who are sports fans, particularly Derek, you'll appreciate this in the Big Ten. You know, a lot of college football is built on a version of round robin competition where each football team plays every other football team in the league, and you get standings about who won most matches. World Cup soccer, before you get to the final championship round, you have a round robin. Lots of sporting events do that. And with ranked ballots, you could do not a runoff system, but you could do the genuine head-to-head -head system and reorient elections to say, well, wait, we've got more than two candidates. We've got five candidates, seven candidates. We got to pick a winner. We don't want a winner that gets only 17% of the votes or 23% of the votes or even 45% of the votes, because anything less than 50% might mean that more than 50% really don't want this candidate. So the true measure of a, of a quality of a candidate is round robin competition. Now that gets to some complexities that we could talk about, uh, about how to design that system. The, the bottom two runoff is the least modification for what's already on the table given your map, right? We already do Alaska and Maine and now New York City and Santa Fe, I mean, every, every state and locality that uses ranked choice ballots uses what is technically called instant runoff voting. So the, the only advantage, if it's an advantage to the BTR system, 
is it, it's built around the instant runoff voting concept. But if we want to rethink majority winner elections, then I totally agree that let's put you know full on the round robin idea on the table and think, should we have round robin elections uh, instead of plurality elections? So let me stop there. So one of the things that uh, has, I think, been or is becoming clear in this discussion so far is there are a, a range of details that um, we can talk about, whether it's doing this through round robin versus bottom two runoff, and whether it's doing it through uh, a kind of uh, top two primary followed by a general or you know, the, the top four that Alaska's trying. There are various different ways. And I think that our time today is best spent one acknowledging that there are any number of permutations that might be worth exploring, but then not actually spending our time beyond that to try and argue which one is necessarily better than the other, but to go back to some foundational questions about whether um, democratic experimentation ought to pursue this, and if so, why? And so one of the questions in the Q&A so far is asking, is this a solution in search of a problem? Um, and I mean, I think we were hoping to have set up in the beginning a, a reason why we think there is a problem here and that doing away or moving away from plurality winner elections might uh, make things better. But I'm still interested if others want to say more about whether there is a, a problem here or not. But let me tie in one more question that came in from the audience. Somebody was observing, one of our observe, one of our audience members was observing or, or sort of at raising the question of to what extent the existing system, this comes back to Rachel's observation about other countries, but to what extent our existing system uh, discourages third party candidates from even trying to participate, the plurality winner system, um, which is a in some sense, a distinct problem, perhaps related to the problem we teed up at the beginning. But there's a moment here where I'm inviting anybody to say a little bit more about to what extent we have a problem. Can I jump in here? I think that, um, so my comments started from the, the, the premise that majority winners are normatively desirable and also a reflection of the sort of our trajectory towards democratic norms over the course of the last 200 years, right? So while the founders may have had a different vision in 1787 and 1789, right? Arguably um, the post-Civil War reconstruction, 1965 version of who America is. And even to bring in Nez's work, the post 12th amendment version of who we are, um, I think sort of lends itself to this, this notion that we want our winners to be majority winners, right? We want um, our members of Congress to be there because they reflect the preferences of the majority of the people in their district. So I think that, yes, it's true that at the founding, there, there definitely was this sense that things were significantly less democratic. And there are aspects of our system that still retain that. But our trajectory is such where, and including trajectory through constitutional amendment, where um, it's clear that majoritarianism is something that is not only normatively desirable, but I think descriptively accurate to describe our system. Uh, yeah, let me let me add a couple things. One is I think, Ned, I like your proposal about moving us the majority uh, majority winner preferences with deference to states to decide how to best do that for the moment. And again, I think. You know, I, I would concur with from Anita's assessment that a majority winners are normatively desirable. <laughs> That's a good thing we want. Um, and in a way, you know, Congress kind of does this. You know, um, it says, you know, it, it banned for for congressional elections in the House. It banned multi-member districts. It says you have to do single-member districts, but then it doesn't tell you how to draw the lines. And um, we're all reading newspaper articles every day about how states are doing that. But it it puts us in the single member district bucket because the thought was that was normatively desirable. And maybe some people think it's less normatively desirable today. But it, but again, it, it's sort of this interesting sort of uh, Congress setting the floor and then sending it to the states to think about it. Um, you know, and again, I think in terms of the you know solution in search of a problem, it, we can set aside the normative component because I think if that's something we want, great, let's look at it. You know, but but again, I think there's there's weird things that happen in any election system, right? So I've mentioned a little bit about the, about the top two, but I'm thinking, you know, Ned, 
you know, you, you pick a good independent candidate of Rob Portman as your potential third person, right? But you could easily find someone who is not so noble or great, but it's a state where the, where the, where the polls are really at, at, at odds with one another, where the Republicans and Democrats just hate each other. And whoever they're going to vote for, they're going to sandbag the other party dead last and put any warm body they can in between them. And so you have a pretty marginal candidate who gets, you know, two percent of the first choice ballots getting to the majority at the end of the day because there's all this sort of sandbagging at the bottom. And again, I, I don't know when that happens. I don't know if that happens, but I just think whatever system you have, there's always sort of warts that come with it. Um, and, and so again, I, I like the system I, I, and I like it you know, compared to some of the other ones that I've considered, um, but it's also a reason that, that there should be some caution. And I think again, a reason why the states should be experimenting and trying out some different solutions about how they wanna, wanna consider getting to a majority winner. Just jump in here with them. Um, I agree on the normative desirability of the majority winners, but I think people don't understand how empirically much this is not the case in the last 20 years. The last 20 years have altered our elections quite a bit because of the level of both gerrymandering, but also sorting of the population. Um, people blame a lot on gerrymandering, and I don't like it because it looks unfair. Um, but the bigger problem has actually been self-sorting of population into different areas. And those two things together mean that our Congress has moved increasingly into safe seats where um, more and more of them are determined in the primaries, but very few people vote in the primary, um, especially primaries that happen in August or um, in the spring when people just are not paying attention. And so you get very small portions of the electorate, 5%, 10%, effectively determining who your uh, leader is. And those proportions of the electorate are not actually um, the same as the rest of the electorate. So among Republicans, for instance, they share very similar policy preferences, but their intensity is very, very different. Um, and their level of affective uh, polarization, their level of real dislike for the other party, very different. And so you end up with different candidates as a result of that. So while you might um, have this majority winner preference, the, the empirical reality of what's happening because of how our population is changing and moving has changed a lot since 2000, since the Bush v. Gore race. And that reality is not looking like it's going to trend in a different direction. The other thing I want to put into that bucket is that um, the increased dissatisfaction with democracy is very high, especially if you look at this millennial generation. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Gen X, we grew up with the Berlin Wall falling down and 9-11 uh, actually brought us together. And there was a lot of things that happened to my generation where we saw democracy as a good thing. This generation is coming with the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, 9-11 as a, as a failure. Um, and they really are not as attached to democracy. And giving more choice is having a broader set of candidates having them see more reflection and representation is, is a positive thing for rebuilding that connection between voter and representation. System structure who runs, and right now we have a spoiler effect because we don't have an RCV-like system. So if you try to come into a party system, you're gonna to be told, oh my God, don't be a spoiler. You're going to, to screw with this system because of the safe seat effect. And so you, you end up with fewer, um, cho fewer choices. And I think that's really depressing positivity toward democracy, especially among this younger generation. And that's just not a good thing for our system over the long haul. Let me make one sort of corollary observations to that, Rachel. We, we've had several questions that are kind of focused on Ohio and some of the dynamics here, although I don't think the dynamics here are unusual, but we are going through redistricting in a process that many observers think is, is as gerrymandered as ever, despite some attempts at political reform here. And a question that one of our uh, audience members asks is, would a majority requirement make any difference when things are that gerrymandered? And I think, you know, Rachel, you're suggesting it, it still would. Uh, at least this is my argument. I don't, won't put words in your mouth, Rachel, but even with heavily gerrymandered districts, um, the actual composition of the slate of candidates uh, could still well be different if we were not using plurality winner elections and the number of people who participate in that election, even in a safe 
district would be larger and different, or at least it's worth experimenting to see whether that in fact is true. And then relatedly, somebody was asking the question of, uh, given the way in which the intended reform to the line drawing process in Ohio has not accomplished what the public thought, why in the world, was there any hope that a reform like this could take hold? And there, I just wanna come back to something Ned said earlier and builds on this notion that we think we are a majoritarian country, even if in fact, we are often falling well short of that. It ought to be relatively easy for elected representatives, maybe with a little public pressure at the congressional level to say, elections need to be determined by a majority winner. And it's up to states, you know, following the experimentation model and Derek's observation off the top that this is easily doable as a matter of law, but it would then be up to states to decide how to determine the majority winner. And if Congress were to say, you know, elections have to be based on a majority winner, that's, that's an easy thing. Now, will Congress go there? I don't know, but the idea of a majority winner is something that ought to be achievable. Thoughts? Well, I know we're coming close to the end of the hour, so I do want to invite our panelists to um, have any final thoughts that, that they want. Just for myself, I, I want to thank them, but I, I do want to say that I, I personally see two dimensions to the problem. One is the uh, lack of full representation along the lines that I think Rachel and others have talked about and the disinfection that can result with that. But the other dimension is what Franita put on the table with us in this post-January 6th environment where we sort of have to worry about our democracy holding together and, and our two-party system may be failing to do that, whether you like a two-party system or not as a, in the abstract, if our two-party system can't function to actually run free and fair elections, that's an additional reason to worry about the sustainability of the system. So that's my final thoughts. And Steve, let, let me see if we have time for it, for final thoughts from our other panelists. Sure. Rachel? Um, I just think that our states are meant to be uh, experimental and that uh, our system was not meant to be set in stone and never has been set in stone. It was meant to be experimented at the state level and that this is a moment where the demographics of our country are such that and the alignment of our ethnicity and parties is such that we need to recognize it's it's a changing moment in, um, and an acute moment when some experimentation is needed. But I don't think any of us should claim to know which way that experimentation will go. Um, we just don't, uh, and we, we really can't. There's too many variables. And so I think we need to be humble about that and it should probably not proceed all that quickly, but I think it needs to proceed. Great. Derek, 20 seconds. Just, uh, I just want to reiterate what you said. I think, uh, how hard can it be? Well, we say that. How hard can it be for Congress to agree? Majority winners should be the winners of elections. Um, th that, that to me is an easy soundbite slogan. Um, and then educating the public about what the mechanism looks like in, from state to state, to Rachel's point, you know, I think is, uh, is more challenging, but that's where, that's where the local officials can maybe address them. Thanks. Fernita, last word. I want to use my 20 seconds to amplify a point that Rachel made that I think is important. Um, our system is not that old. And I think part of it is that we get it in our minds that we are sort of wed or shackled to this particular system because it's what we have, because it's what we know in our lifetime. But there are other ways to do this. As a country, we've done this in other ways. Um, and so I think the experiment, experimentation point is a good one as well. Like, let's experiment. Let's see. I'm glad we're having this conversation about um, what Ned has put on the table, because that's an important part of the process. But we do have to get away from this idea that the way it is now is how it's always been, because that's just simply not true. Well, Franita, Derek, Rachel, Ned, many thanks to all of you for doing this with us today. And uh, Thanks to everybody in the audience for joining us and for submitting questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Be well.